situation, we were averaging about 20,000 new cases a day. And then a series of circumstances associated with various states and cities trying to open up in the sense of getting back to some form of normality has led to a situation where we now had record breaking cases. Uh, two days ago, it was at 57,500. So within a period of a week and a half, we've almost doubled the number of cases. So in answer to your first question, uh, we are still knee deep in the first wave of this. And I would say this would not be considered a wave. Mm -hmm. It was a, a surge or a resurgence of infections mm -hmm. superimposed mm -hmm. upon a baseline, Francis, that really never got down to where we wanted to go. If you look at the, at the graphs from Europe, Europe, the European Union as an entity, it went up and then came down to baseline. Now they're having little blips, as you might expect, as they try to reopen. Mm -hmm. We went up never came down to baseline, and now we're surging back up. So it's a serious situation that we have to address immediately. Yeah, well, we're going to talk in a minute about vaccines, which you're deeply engaged in, and treatments, and better diagnostics. Uh, but at the moment, what should people do who are listening to this, who want to try to do what they can do uh, to try to deal with this surge and not have it get any worse? What's the recommendation? Yeah. Well, Francis, the recommendation, regardless of where you are in the country, and different parts of the countries have different stages. Some are still at gateway, some at phase one, two, or three. Regardless of where you are, the fundamental concepts, physical distancing, wear a mask at all times when you're outside, when it would be a situation where it's unlikely that you're going to be able to stay physically. Wash your hands often, avoid crowds, do not go into places where there's a large crowd. Outdoors, always better than indoors. If you're going to have a social function, maybe a single couple or two, do it outside if you're going to do it. Those are fundamental, and everybody can do that right now. They can. I think part of the problem is people have grown tired of those requirements. Uh, I have grandsons who are like restless about, wait a minute, why do we have to keep on behaving this way? Uh, it's been too many months. But unfortunately, the virus doesn't care that we're tired about this. And you can see the consequences of people relaxing a little too much. It is the case, isn't it, now that a lot of those new cases are younger people? Yeah. Uh, maybe yeah. because they have yeah. been willing to go to places like bars, which are not a good place to be if you don't want to catch this. Some people are saying, well, we don't have to worry so much because young people don't usually get that sick. But there's a problem with that, isn't there? Well, there's a big problem with that, Francis. First of all, you're right. The average age of people getting infected now is a decade and a half younger than what it was a few months ago, particularly when New York and New Orleans and Chicago were getting hit very badly. That's the first thing. The second thing that we're trying to get the messaging across, young people should not feel that they're invulnerable to serious consequences. The more we learn about this disease, Francis, the more we realize that many young people may not necessarily get sick enough to go to the hospital, but they can get very sick, put them out of action for weeks at a time. The other thing is they should not think that even if they get infected and they have no symptoms at all, that they are in a vacuum. They're not because by getting infected, they are propagating the outbreak because inadvertently or innocently, they could infect someone who would infect mm -hmm. someone and then all of a sudden, someone's grandmother, grandfather, or aunt who's getting chemotherapy for breast cancer gets infected. So although you think you're isolated in a vacuum, you're not. You're part of the propagation of the pandemic. So it's your responsibility to yourself as well as to society to avoid infection. That's a message. I know it's difficult to get out to young people, but they really need to understand that. Yeah, I saw the Surgeon General's public service announcement, which is a good way to say this, which is put on your mask and then COVID stops with you. And if we all can think about that, it's up to us, each of us, to stop this pandemic. It's not some decision that's going to be made in the governor's mansion. It's about us deciding that this is our responsibility. Hey, we can do that. Well, let's talk about vaccines. The world is a buzz about vaccines as the way in which we might ultimately get past this and have a chance to go back to something approaching normal life where we can all be back together again because this risk won't be so high. 
Where are we, uh, Tony, with the vaccine efforts that have been moving forward at unprecedented speed? But of course, uh, they are full of scientific challenges. Uh, tell us about that. Yeah, I think the first thing people need to understand that although timetables are given, whenever you're dealing with a, a vaccine development, there's never a guarantee that your candidate will be both safe and effective. So there's always the big question mark. However, assuming that there will be one and maybe more safe and effective vaccines, here's where we are with the timeline. There are multiple candidates using different platforms, several of which the United States government and the NIH itself, we are involved in helping to facilitate the development, either directly or indirectly with our sites. If things go the way it looks like they're going, one of these candidates will enter phase three trial for efficacy at the end of July. Other candidates will sequentially come in, another one at the end of August, one in September, and one in October. They have different platforms, yet there's some commonality among them. The protocols are harmonized. We're using consistent laboratory data that we're going to be measuring, and the endpoints are the same. So we hope as we go along that by the end of this year or the beginning of 2021, we will at least have an answer whether the vaccine or vaccines, plural, are safe and effective. In, if so, and this question always gets asked, we are now working with the companies barter by their investment to start making doses before we even know whether it works or not. So that when we get to the winter and the early part of 2021, we will start to have a large number of doses that people will be able to use if it turns out to be safe and effective. The big if. So does that mean if uh, one of those vaccines doesn't turn out to be safe and effective, you just have to throw out all of those doses that were made because it wanted to be ready, but it isn't always going to work? The, the answer to your question, Francis, unfortunately, <laughs> is yes. But that is a financial risk. That is yeah. not a risk for safety, nor is it a risk for scientific integrity. And I think that's what the general public needs to understand. The risk we're taking is to gain months so that we will be able to have it ready. And if we lose that, we're only losing money. I'm glad you pointed that out because people hear this term Operation Warp Speed, which is part of what is now guiding the government's effort in this space. And they're concerned that sounds like we are cutting corners with safety and efficacy. Absolutely not the case. The corners that are being cut are things like doing this manufacturing at risk so you don't have a long lag time after the vaccine proves to be effective where you have to wait uh, for the doses to appear. That can't be said often enough. I want to assure everybody, because you, you and I are in all these conversations, oftentimes many times a day and late into the night, that there will be no compromising on the principles of safety and efficacy. Whatever we come up with in a few months is going to be just as rigorously tested as any vaccine ever has been. Indeed. So, uh, these, these trials that you're talking about starting this month, are going to be pretty big, aren't they? Uh, you, if you want to know if the vaccine works, you got to test it in a lot of people in an area where the virus is spreading, so you'll know whether it provided protection. Uh, how many people are we talking about, and where is this going to happen? Well, the number of people on on the trials are going to be thirty thousand, fifteen thousand to receive the vaccine, and fifteen thousand to go unvaccinated. You know, Francis, we made an investment, you and I, years and years ago in the clinical trials network that we put together for HIV, for influenza, for a variety of other emerging infections. We're leveraging that now because these trials are going to be taking place in multiple sites in the United States, as well as the international collaborations that we've made in Mexico, in Brazil, and in South Africa. So these are collaborations that were scientific NIH collaborations from a long time ago. And what we're going to do, we're going to have the flexibility of going where the outbreak is percolating so that you could wind up hopefully getting an efficacy signal within a reasonable period of time. And it will be important uh, to encourage people to enroll. So people who are watching this right now uh, might want to pay attention in two or three weeks uh, to announcements that there might be a vaccine trial enrollment somewhere in your neighborhood because right. we will 
depend on the public uh, to sign up and help us figure this out. Let's be clear, these vaccines have already gone through phase one and phase two trials. So we know that they've been safe, significant number of individuals, and we know that they seem to be capable of raising antibodies, but we haven't actually done the real testing in the field that is gonna be in the so-called phase three trials. But particularly, Tony, it seems to me, because this disease, COVID-19, has hit particular groups really hard. And I'm talking about older people, people with chronic disease, African Americans, Latinos, we want to be sure that the vaccine enrollment includes those folks as well. Um, are there ways based on past experience where we are sure that outreach will work and we will get people to sign up from those groups? Well, uh, thank you, Francis. What, what Dr. Collins was referring to, leading me into the answer to the question, was that <laughs> this is... I'm good at that. <laughs> <laughs> this is something that we have done with all our HIV trials, there is an analogy here. When you're dealing with HIV, there's a disparity of susceptibility, of involvement. 13% of the American population is African American and 45 to 50% of the new infection. So whenever we do treatment and prevention trials through our networks, we outreach through community representatives and community outreach. We're gonna use that same model to do the same thing for the African-American, Latinx, and Native American populations. In fact, Francis and I right now are very heavily involved in making right. sure that the trials are quite well represented by the individuals who are most susceptible, not only to infection because of certain circumstances in their life, but also because of the fact that they are more prone to complications because of underlying comorbidities. It's a major goal of the trial to be properly represented. And that's what we're gonna make certainly a high priority. Right, so there'll be a lot of emphasis on that in the coming weeks for sure. And what about treatments, Tony? Because people are still getting sick with COVID-19 right now, some of them very sick, and a lot of work's been going on there. Where are we in terms of knowing that there's some things that can help them? Well, right now, due to the performance of randomized placebo-controlled trials, we have two types of therapies that are good for people with advanced disease. Remdesivir in an NIH-sponsored trial, over a thousand individuals, was shown to diminish the time to recovery in individuals in the hospital with pulmonary disease. Another study done in the UK looked at deaths and in individuals on respirators requiring oxygen versus those who had earlier disease. And dexamethasone, which is the glucocorticoid, an anti-inflammatory, was effective statistically significantly in diminishing the deaths in ventilated patients, in patients on oxygen, but not in individuals with early disease, which goes along with what we know about pathogenesis, that you wanna hit the virus early, but once you get advanced disease, it's the aberrant inflammatory response that you want to suppress. What we do need and that we're in the process of very actively testing, uh, we want therapies and prophylaxis for people early in the course of the disease. And that could take the form of passive transfer of antibody, monoclonal antibodies, hyperimmune globulin, and any of a number of antivirals that we're testing and screening. So we need to get a lot of work done for the early one to prevent people from being hospitalized. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's also a trial about to get started on anticoagulants. That is for right. people who are very sick because it's clear this virus does something to make the blood clot unnecessarily vigorously and results in clotting in the lungs and other parts of the body. And maybe we could help with that as well uh, just by providing a blood thinner. All of these pieces of the uh, puzzle coming together over the course of several months and leading to all of these ideas that we're trying to test simultaneously, but to prioritize them and helps a lot that we have a public-private partnership called ACTIVE to kind of bring all those ideas together. Coming back to the vaccines, I keep getting asked, uh, Tony, okay, so suppose this all looks really good and you have a vaccine that's safe and effective and we start immunizing people how long will that protection last? When you've okay. got a vaccine, are you gonna need to take it again? Uh, a year later, it's gonna be like the flu where you have to have a shot every year or will you get a booster now? Now, what do you think? 
Well, this is, Francis, a great question. And it's the reason why we have to be humble about what we do. We do not know the answer to that. We do not know. I mean, you can assume that you're going to get protection at least to take us through this cycle. When you look at natural infection, it's anywhere between six months to a year. However, with this spike protein that's being presented in the way that we do it, with primes and in some cases boost, we're going to assume that there's a degree of protection, but we have to assume that it's going to be finite. It's not going to be like a measles vaccine. So there's going to be follow-up in those cases to see if we might need a boost. We may need a boost to continue the protection, but right now we do not know how long it lasts. And do we know whether people who got natural infection uh, with this virus, SARS-CoV-2, can get reinfected? Are there cases where people really got better and then got sick again? There are no documented cases where people got better and actually got sick again in the sense of virus replicating. They were able uh -huh. to, re to do PCR of what was likely viral fragments that showed mm -hmm. up on PCR. The idea of relapses, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a rare case of an individual who went into remission and relapsed. We saw that in Ebola. Remember that, the, the big surprise in Ebola, particularly oh, yeah. the Scottish nurse who got, who, went out, who got better and then came back with neurological disease. But Francis, I could say with confidence that it is very unlikely if it's a common phenomenon that people recover they usually have a period of time where you can get virus out by PCR, but we're showing now that's unlikely to be replication competent virus. So you're saying this is a pretty good virus for a vaccine to work. Uh, it has right. this ability where natural infection does seem to be protective. It doesn't seem to mutate too rapidly compared to some others. Is that fair? That is fair. It's, it's an RNA virus, and as we know, RNA viruses mutate, but the functional consequence of that mutation so far doesn't look to be impressive. Well, okay. So all of these things coming along, the treatments. Uh, meanwhile, in terms of testing, well, we know that uh, tests have gotten much more widely available in the last few months. More than 30 million tests have been done in the U.S. We at NIH are working to try to come up with new technologies that allow point of care testing so you can find out your answer on the spot as opposed to sending off a swab and finding out the result uh, a day or two later. Everybody's very concerned though about what happens in the fall in terms of going back to school, whether you're talking K through 12 or whether like my grandson, you wanna to go to college and have a freshman experience. And I'm sure you get asked about this all the time, Tony, what's the right answer in terms of trying to plan that return to school in the fall. Yeah. Well, Francis, there, there, there are parameters depending upon whether you mean a local school, like an elementary or a middle school, versus a university where people are coming from all different parts of the country. If we want to focus on elementary school, it really is dependent on the location where you are and the dynamics of the virus spread in your location. If you're in a county, in Casper, Wyoming, where there's almost no infections, you probably don't have to do anything and get children back to school. If you're in an area where you really want to get the children back to school, even though there is viral activity, because the unintended consequences of keeping children out of school sometimes can be very, very difficult to deal with. So the fundamental principle is you want to do whatever you can to safely get the kids back to school. If you need to make modifications, there are some creative ways that school principals, school superintendents are doing. Modifying the schedules, separation of desks, wearing masks under certain circumstances, protecting the vulnerables by allowing them to do online classes. There's a variety of ways to do that. But the bottom line is, it depends on the activity of virus in the location that you're talking about. Right. Which means you kind of need to know that, which is why testing is now more exactly. Broad. That's a good thing. So even Casper, Wyoming might want to be keeping tabs on whether there's any of the virus starting to appear in their community. Right. But he is completely guaranteed uh, to be free of this going forward. And I guess one of the things we've learned uh, is that if there is an indication of an uptick in infections, then it's important to jump on it right away. Uh, the idea of waiting until you see a very strong 
uh, increase in the number of cases means you've already kind of lost a lot of the time that you might have been able uh, to retain uh, to keep things from spreading so widely. Is that one of the things that we all should have learned maybe uh, from what's happening right now is that when you see something starting to go the wrong way, you act quickly? Absolutely, Francis. And that's there's so many uh, spinoffs of that that are important. We have to make sure now that, you know, when we locked down, and we didn't lock down completely, but when we did, it was important to make sure that we had the testing capability, the manpower to conduct that, and the health system to make sure that you could isolate people. Doing contact tracing without isolating people doesn't work. So when we get to the area that we want to be, like for example, in New York City right now, New York successfully got their cases way down. What they're focusing on right now is they see the little blips come up, they've got to be able to do just what you said, identify, isolate, contact trace, and prevent the little blip from becoming a surge of infections. Yeah. So Tony, people sometimes look at uh, you and me and say, oh, these public health people, uh, they're just always looking at what might happen in terms of spread of the virus and telling us we all have to stay home forever. And they don't appreciate what the consequences are uh, for relationships, for the economy, uh, for people's ability to kind of get through life. Um, I, I don't think that that's a fair uh, criticism of the view that we have, but I do think as public health experts, we got to answer the questions when they come at us. Right. I think you would agree there are ways that we can get our economy functioning but we got to do it really carefully. The answer is not just to lock down the country for the next year until the vaccine is available, but it's got to be some blend of, right. of all of those parameters together because we know people are suffering right now. Right. Yeah, you know, Francis, the way I put it, and, 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 and when people listen, I hope they appreciate it, that rather than looking at the public health effort versus economic opening as if they were opposing forces. They're not. We should use the public health effort as a vehicle and a pathway to get to safe reopening. It's not an obstacle. It's a pathway to do that. So we've got to make sure that we don't create this binary type thing. It's us against them. It's not. We're all in it together. The public health people, as much as anybody else, wants to see the country open and wants to see the economy go back. That's what we want. We're all in it together. So the public health effort, as you said very correctly, if done prudently and carefully, will facilitate the opening, not be an obstacle to the opening. That's very well said. I hope everybody heard that loud and clear, because all too often in our polarized society, even this issue tends to get polarized or, gosh, <laughs> maybe even politicized. Can you imagine that? Uh, Tony has just really laid out what the real principle ought to be here. Well, Tony, I know uh, you're a busy guy, and uh, I kind of am too. Uh, we should probably try and wind this up. But before we go, people are feeling uh, like this is never going to come to an end. <laughs> the uncertainty and the anxiety uh, is weighing on people, and many people have seen loved ones fall ill or even die. And so this has been a really rough period, these months for our country and some people wondering, are we going to get through this? So what would you say to those folks who are just trying to get through each day and wondering, is there ever going to be a better time for us? You know, Francis, I, I, I could say, as, as, as I'm sure you can as a public health person, as a scientist, it will end, Francis. We will get through this for absolutely certain. We've already suffered through a lot of pain, a lot of economic and personal pain and inconvenience, but it will end. It will end because the public health efforts will succeed ultimately, and science will get us through this. We will get a vaccine. We will get therapies for early disease and for late disease. So the only message that I think we can jointly tell the American public and the global public that we will get through this, hang in there, it will end. We promise you. <laughs> well said. Yes, this bad boy, this is my model of the uh, coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, with all of those spiky proteins uh, that just is the way that it likes to get inside of your cells. We are going to vanquish this guy. He is you not bet. 
up top for a whole lot longer. And we just need all of the people in America to have that confidence, uh, keep your optimism, keep your hope, and do the right thing. Because uh, again, it can stop with each one of us the further spread of this if we'll stick with those recommendations about wearing your mask, that six foot distance apart, frequent hand washing, it's trying not to get into any indoor circumstances where you're packed together. All of those simple and straightforward things that I know you're a little tired of, but the virus is still out there and needs all of us to keep this uh, from getting any worse. And then hang on, because science, the best science uh, that you can imagine, uh, led by amazing people like Tony Fauci and many others, is going to come forward here uh, with what we believe will be ultimately uh, a chance for us all to get back to the kind of lives that we were le leaving, leading uh, in 2019. And you know what? All of us, in a few years, we'll have parties where we talk about, what did you do in 2020? <laughs> <laughs> Our grandchildren will tell their grandchildren what they did in 2020. Because this is unlike anything we've faced before, but we're up to it. We have the courage, the strength, the vision, and the energy to make it happen, and the hope. So thanks, Tony. It was great to talk to you and have a chance to have this conversation. Thank you, Francis. I appreciate you having me uh, here on your show. Take care. <laughs> okay. Bye, everybody.